Welcome to the Broadway.com show, filmed in the historic Brill Building in the heart of Times Square. I'm Imogen Lloyd Webber. And I'm Ryan Lee Gilbert. Today we hit the red carpet on opening night of Meteor Shower, celebrate 20 years of the movie Anastasia with an amazing performance from Christy Altamar and more. And later, SpongeBob SquarePants director Tina Landau discusses bringing the Nickelodeon cartoon to the Great White Way in splashy musical form. But first, let's get started with the news. What's the buzz, Ryan? Tony and Grammy nominee Sarah Bareilles, who made her Broadway stage debut earlier this year in Waitress, will rejoin the cast of her hit musical beginning early next year. Betsy Wolf, who currently plays the down-on-her-luck pie maker, will take her final bow at the Brooks Atkinson Theatre on January 9th, 2018. And Bareilles will begin performances January 16th, playing a limited engagement through February 25th. For the first two weeks of her engagement, Bareilles will star opposite her friend and collaborator, Jason Mraz, who is currently making his Broadway debut as Dr. Pometer. Mraz will now play his final performance in The Delicious Show on January 28th. M. Butterfly is to fold its wings six weeks early on Broadway. The revival of David Henry Huang's 1988 Tony-winning play is set to shutter on January 14, 2018, after 19 previews and 93 regular performances. Directed by Lion King Tony winner Julie Taymor and headlined by Oscar nominee Clive Owen, expectations were high for the show, which officially opened on October the 26th. M. Butterfly follows the relationship between a French diplomat living in China and a soprano at the Beijing Opera. It caused a sensation when it first bowed 30 years ago. So if you're intrigued, get yourself over to the court theatre ASAP. Nominations for the 60th Annual Grammy Awards were announced this week, and three Broadway cast recordings are in the mix for Best Musical Theatre Album. The cast recording for the 2017 Tony-winning Best Musical Dear Evan Hansen is among the nominees, as are the albums for Come From Away and the Tony-winning Best Musical Revival Hello Dolly. The three-album race follows three consecutive years of five recordings receiving nominations in this category. Meanwhile, original Dear Evan Hansen headliner Ben Platt and Hello Dolly's Bette Midler who both earned Tonys for their performances, are the only vocalists included in the musical theatre album nominations. The Grammy Awards ceremony, hosted by Tony winner James Corden, will air January 28, 2018 on CBS. Weren't there more than three musical theatre albums in the last year? Yes, there were at least three dozen. We know them so well. Ramin Karamlu, Karen Olivo, Raul Esparza and Ruthie Ann Miles will take on the roles of Anatoly, Florence, Freddie and Svetlana respectively in a new production of Chess. Not to be confused with the revival at the London Coliseum in spring 2018, this version will run at Kennedy Centre in Washington DC from February 14th through February the 18th. Michael Mayer is on board to helm the cult classic, which features music by ABBA songwriters Benny Anson and Bjorn Ubias, lyrics by Tim Rice and a book by Richard Nelson. Set against the backdrop of the Cold War, with an American and a Russian chess master becoming pawns of their governments, this piece should feel right at home in the US Capitol. Is this the one that includes the song, Winner Takes It All? That's Mamma Mia, Ryan. Bruce Springsteen will be performing on Broadway a little bit longer. The iconic rock star announced this week that Springsteen on Broadway has extended its run at the Walter Kerr Theater for an additional four months in order to meet overwhelming audience demand. The acclaimed show, which opened October 12th, had already been extended once through February 3rd, 2018, and will now run through June 30th of next year. The show traces the arc of Springsteen's life through songs as well as dialogue, and celebrates his illustrious career, which spans over 40 years and includes 20 Grammys, an Oscar, an induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a Kennedy Center honor. The boss seems to like it here on Broadway. Do you think he'd be down to stick around a little bit longer for a revival of The Music Man? Well, this is one to watch. Roundabout Theatre Company has presented a private reading of Richard Morris and Meredith Wilson's musical The Unsinkable Molly Brown. A roundabout representative confirmed to us here at Broadway.com that Fun Home Tony nominee Beth Malone took on the lead role of Molly Tobin, with Kathleen Marshall directing from an adapted book by Dick Scanlon. The trio previously collaborated on the show over the summer at the Muni, as well as an earlier version at Denver Theatre Centre back in 2014. Watch this space. When we come back, we hit the red carpet with Uma Thurman and the cast of The Parisian Woman, as well as Amy Schumer and the cast of Meteor Shower, and more. This week on Broadway.com, Mindhunter's Jonathan Groff visits show people. New backstage vlogs from Haley Kilgore at Once on this Island, Lily Cooper at SpongeBob SquarePants, and Tyler Haynes at Cats. A fun game of Never Have I Ever with the stars of School of Rock and more. 
Ben Brantley of the New York Times calls the Book of Mormon the best musical of this century. This was my fourth time seeing it, and they still had me at Hello, winner of nine Tony Awards, including Best Musical. The Book of Mormon on Broadway. Hi, this is Jonathan Groff, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Welcome back. Oscar nominee Uma Thurman made her Broadway debut this week in The Parisian Woman. The play by Bo Williman, creator of the Netflix hit House of Cards, explores the powerful world of a savvy Washington, D.C. socialite in the wake of the 2016 presidential election. We hit the red carpet on opening night to catch up with the cast. It's a tragic, sardonic, dramatic comedy about our current moment. And I think that that is something that everybody needs, you know, like, I think we're all laughing through our tears at the news at this point. It's a wild, fun comedy, really. I mean, that's the really joyful experience is watching audiences walk in and be so in love with the comedy and the laughter and so ready to just have a fun ride, you know. And then some stuff sort of settles in where it becomes like, oh, what is going on here? It's talking about the political situation in Washington, but you know, in this what we call the soft corridor. So it's nobody that is in power. It's not any of those people that we read about, but it's all those people that are around it. One represents business, one's about the law, one's going into government. There's a young woman coming up that uh, you know has real political ideals, and there's another woman there that is kind of an intellectual and a dilettante in a good way. It's how they're all looking at that and how they're trying to find their way in a lawless country. In addition to telling a timely tale, the stars are also thrilled to welcome Uma Thurman to Broadway. Uma is an extraordinary human being. She's a very strong individual. Uh, I admire her immensely. I have a lot of respect for her. Uh, an Amazon, a titan, a mythical figure. She has such extraordinary strength and she's a very sensitive soul strong opinions, an intelligent person, and I've loved working with her. She would always come to the table with something new and fresh and different, and for me it was great because it really shook me out of a sort of like idea of what I had for a scene, and you know, she would just throw something out there and it would be like, oh, thank God, so good. Well, I'm just so proud that, you know, like a, a, a group of fantastic, fantastic actors are telling this incredibly present tense story, and uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, and my, my design team, I mean, I just think that there's some surprising stuff on the stage. And doing a brand new play on Broadway is also not, not seen as often anymore. And so that's also super exciting. It has been such a generous group of people who have really thrown themselves into this, who I think have had a really positive and rewarding experience. And it's always hard to do it, but, but this has been hard in a good way, the way that it's supposed to be hard, which is everyone pushing themselves to excel. I think they have, I'm proud of that. And um, that's really all that matters to me. December 4th marks Dear Evan Hansen's first year anniversary on The Great White Way. We caught up with show standout Laura Dreyfus in her cozy, cool dressing room to look back at what it was like to spend the past year on Broadway in one of the hottest tickets in town. On December 4th, Dear Evan Hansen will have been open for exactly one year, which is crazy. <laughs> I remember uh, auditioning for the workshop and I had read the script and I just knew from the writing that this was something that I could really appreciate and it resonated with me as a person. It was just like a dream come true project to be a part of from day one. I think a year into this process, being on Broadway, I, I've learned just like how much this show reaches people. After premiering at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., Dear Evan Hansen had its off-Broadway bow at Second Stage Theater on March 26, 2016. From that first New York opening night, critics and audiences knew that this show was something special. I think one of the most memorable moments was actually our opening night at Second Stage. We were bowing at the end of the show. We left the stage to go up to our dressing rooms and at least three minutes had gone by, like solid minutes. So people were still on their feet clapping, waiting for us. They wouldn't stop until we came back down and gave another encore bow. It was just like a really cool, amazing feeling to realize that like it was, there was just so much love coming at us and we were all just crying because we were so moved by it. Ben Platt and I met uh, probably, I think it was day one of rehearsal actually for the workshop and we just instantly connected. We both really cared about this project and about these characters and so that was an easy way for us to really bond and then spending so much time together in DC just really formed our friendship which was really amazing. When Noah Galvin started, we had maybe three or four rehearsals with him, just him and I and Michael Greif 
in um, a studio. And that was really cool because it was just, he is his own person and he completely took the role on and made it his own. And that was so exciting to me as an actor because you can just rediscover things with them. Um, and he's so incredibly talented and, and aware of who this character is, but it's so his own and it's so specific to him. And so that's been really exciting. I hope for the future that this show just reaches more people. I think it's a really important story and I think that it's shedding light on a lot of topics that most people are afraid to talk about. And I think that that's the biggest takeaway that people get from this is knowing that oh, that they're not alone and that they can talk to people about things that felt scary to talk about. Um, and just teaching empathy and how to feel for another person. So I really hope that the show continues. I hope that there's, I hope the tour reaches more people. I hope that, I just want the story to get out. After landing a Tony nomination in 2016 for co-writing the musical Bright Star, Hollywood funny man Steve Martin has made his Broadway playwriting debut with Meteor Shower, which opened at the Booth Theatre on November the 29th. The offbeat comedy tells of a crazy night for two couples in an Ojai, California home and marks the Broadway debut of Amy Schumer, who plays Corky, a young married woman who really wants to stay married. She says working with comedy icon Martin is a dream. When he asked me, uh to read it and then to be in it, I was like, absolutely. I did a, his play in college, so it was uh, it meant a lot to me to get to get to do this. Schumer is joined by Tony nominee Jeremy Shamos as her hubby Norm, and Tony winner Laura Benanti and Emmy winner Keegan Michael Key as Laura and Gerald, a wild couple that disrupts Corky's night. Broadway fave Benanti says her scenes with Schumer are a personal high point. My favorite moment in the play is when I'm on the sheds with Amy. Yeah, she makes me laugh just harder than any person on the face of the planet. She's so funny. I laugh every night. I laugh every single night at something she does because she does something spontaneous every evening and it's, uh, I just adore her. The Steve Martin, his funny foursome is everything a writer could ask for and more. What you have are really funny people and it, it's a rarity to have four of them. They're like a uh, they're like a treasure you find on the beach. I can't believe I've got four really funny people doing this. And not only that, they know how to, to give it over to the other person when they're being funny, and then it becomes their turn to be funny, and it's just a beautiful thing to watch. It's like watching a string quartet. It's kind of hard to believe, but it's been 20 years since the beloved animated film Anastasia hit theaters. To celebrate the anniversary, the Broadway production of Anastasia hosted a special performance of Journey to the Past, sung by star Christy Altamar at the Broadhurst Theatre. It was incredible, surreal, unbelievable. 20 years since the animated film came out in the theaters. We are all so excited and grateful to be a part of the show at this historic time in Anastasia history. I just feel like, especially in today's day and age, it's so important to have this message that this fairy tale story brings across, which is this beautiful character, Anya that is afraid but knows against all odds she needs to find her family and she moves forward even through fear and I think that is a beautiful just lesson in life if we could all live that way that yes life is going to have its obstacles but if you keep moving forward with love and hope in your heart anything is possible. You might think performing Journey to the Past eight times a week would get old but Christy Altamar certainly doesn't think so. No it never gets old it never gets old I'm tearing up now thinking about it Journey to the Past is it is a classic, and I could listen to that song every day and never ever get tired of it.
When we return, we learn all about Bikini Bottom with SpongeBob SquarePants director, Tina Landau. These artists will come together for only one thing. It's not a concert. It's not an award show. It's SpongeBob the Musical on Broadway. Mostly known as a playwright and director with a love of experimental theater, Tina Landau has taken a deep dive into Bikini Bottom with Broadway's new SpongeBob SquarePants, featuring a fantastic score written by rock stars, eye-popping visual design, and an unforgettable set of characters. This new musical is a creative explosion from start to finish. Landau recently stopped by to talk about her inspiration for the project on the eve of the show's opening night. Welcome, Tina. Hi. How are happy you feeling? To be here. You've been putting together a big Broadway musical for years, and it's about to, you're about to give birth to it. I know. I try not to think about the length of time because it, it staggers me. I saw the show. I fell in love with the show. I'm so glad. And I have to tell you, I walked into this show knowing nothing about SpongeBob SquarePants, but I walked in and I just sort of fell in love with this world you created. And and it's a theatrical, sort of a, it's a theatrical representation yes, of, exactly. of this show. But you also kind of walked into this project not knowing that much about it. No, I watched the series a couple times because I have nieces and nephews. But when I first got the call about doing the show for my agent, who said, "Do you want to go in and pitch?" They're seeing directors because they want to start with a visual approach. Uh -huh. I said, "No, no, I'm not interested," because all that could go through my mind were was like a big stadium show or mm -hmm. a show with big mascots. Yeah, a big sponge. A guy yeah, with a big rubber sponge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but once they said, no, 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 we're not looking for a literal representation. We want to explode it open in some way and uh, find some new life, a new way that this brand can live on stage. I thought, well, that's an interesting challenge. Let me do a little research. And mm -hmm. then I did, and then I fell in love with it. The funny thing is, one thing I was told uh, from the beginning is little kids love SpongeBob and stoners love SpongeBob. I was, I was told these two facts. I know. It's amazing. The show is accessible to children, uh -huh. but I would say the audience that is really eating it up is like 20s to 40s. Uh -huh. um, and I think, I don't know why. Uh, you know, I, they yeah. grew up with it. And yeah. um, Ethan, the, our lead who plays Ethan SpongeBob, Slater Ethan Slater, was actually watching SpongeBob the day he got uh, a call to come in and audition for this. <laughs> so I also just want to say um, about what you said about not knowing the show. Yeah. We really tried to build it so there was enough Easter eggs for those that do know it and love it, mm -hmm. and yet introduce the world and the characters um, from scratch for yeah. people who don't. Yeah, and apparently rock stars love SpongeBob SquarePants too because your score is incredible. And so you so you have a score created by a bunch of rock stars, but it feels like a Broadway score. I don't know how you did it. I, I assume Tom Kitt was a big part Tom of that. Tom Kitt is a genius, big part of it. You know, the thing is, the SpongeBob world invites variety and mashup and juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. So I knew from the beginning that the score had to be less cohesive than it had to have tremendous variety, mm -hmm. and in the same way that the show does. Um, and we asked the composers to write in their own voices. We were very specific with the moments and what we asked them to write. Okay. And so they came in really telling the story and write for that particular moment. And um, almost to a person when we asked, the response was yes, and a lot because they love SpongeBob. Wow. So. Who knew? And so Kyle Jarrow wrote the book. Yes. He, he's sort of a new on the Broadway scene. Yes. What, what was this collaboration like? And how did you figure out what the story would be? Um, you know, it was interesting. We did a workshop first that was just about physical movement before Kyle was even on board. Mm -hmm. Because before we even got into story, we wanted to see, is this idea insane or is there some seed of something here? Right. Um, so then Kyle came in and that was great because he had a whole kind of physical and visual world to inspire him. Um, and we had, I think, about three big story ideas that we pitched and ended up with the one we have now. And we knew simply that an audience had to care and be interested for two and a half hours mm -hmm. as opposed to 11 minutes, and that the stakes had to be high. I was unexpectedly touched by the show. And so it really ends up being sort of this beautiful story about friendship and about community. Yes. Why does this story sort of work for this? Well, um, first of all, you know, 
it's, it's a world where the logic is its own. So if they say, oh, there's a volcano named Mount Humongous and it's <laughs> going to erupt tomorrow, right. there's, you just buy it because yep. the rules are all invented. And, you know, SpongeBob is the eternal optimist. He's wonderfully naive and childlike and, and has hope and belief that things can work out. So he's the perfect hero to you know, be plopped inside of a community that is tearing itself apart, mostly because of fear. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of a portrait of what happens in a society when um, people feel threatened and yeah. how they act out on each other and um, their town. In other words, extremely timely. <laughs> you know, so, so it turns out. Right, yes, so it turns exactly. out. No, so the show has gotten increasingly timely. Yeah. Yeah, it's you know, fascinating. And, and we've never worked to put very specific topical things in it. We've kind of done the opposite. But yeah, I'd say it's universal to, you know, the fall of Rome and perhaps the current USA moment. David Zinn, uh, your set designer, created this big, beautiful world that you experience the minute you show up yeah. for the show. Uh, but what I love about your work on the show is that it seems like you really went out of your way to have moments in the show. So many dramatic moments are actually done very simply and very theatrically. And, and there's not a lot of high tech with, within this big, beautiful set. A lot of what's happening yeah, exactly. is actually really simplistic and very theatrical, which is what I really love about your work. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you saw it that way. That's what we aimed for. We wanted the audience to come in and be in an environment. You know, one of the things I said to Nickelodeon at the get go was, if we do this on stage, it has to be because it's live and we are there with it, yeah. not looking at it mm -hmm. in a proscenium because we do that on a TV or a computer or a, a movie screen. So let's make a world that we enter, place the audience inside Bikini Bottom, and then within that um, arena, allow the piece to unfold in ways that are as simple as things that happen on the TV show, which mm -hmm. is, you know, SpongeBob and Patrick make magic from a cardboard box. And that was always sort of my model. Like, well, what object could we use to do this thing? Because that's what Bikini Bottom is. It's made up of found objects at the bottom of the ocean. What did you love as kids? Like, do you remember your early theatrical? Early theatrical? Yeah, what like really like sparked the oh theater my magic gosh. for you? Well, I grew up here and I was taken to theater every weekend. So, you know, um, Dream Girls, Chorus Line, saw the originals. Okay. I mean, I was, I knew I wanted to be a director when I was six. Wow. It was either a director or an oceanographer, for real. <laughs> like, I always had a thing about being And now underwater. you're underwater. When, in and SpongeBob. now I'm doing both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As someone with roots in experimental theater, is creating something like Bikini Bottom for Broadway the ultimate? SpongeBob feels like an expression of everything I am. I mean, in terms of you know, yes, experimental theater and slightly avant-garde techniques, but also my love of the American musical, um, my crazy child-like love of play. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> and I've gotten to just live in that for so long, and I feel like I've received so much joy from the material. Well, I think you're giving joy to audiences. Joy I definitely, is the word. I definitely felt it. So congratulations. Thank you, Paul. Happy opening. Thank you and so much. I can't wait to see it again. You're going to see me in Bikini Bottom again. Yay. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks for well, coming We will welcome you. Thank <laughs> you. When we come back, Tony winner Anna Lee Ashford returns to Wicked for a wonderful performance. Ben Brantley of the New York Times calls the Book of Mormon the best musical of this century. This was my fourth time seeing it, and they still had me at Hello, winner of nine Tony Awards, including Best Musical. The Book of Mormon on Broadway. Hey, my name is Ariel Stachel, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Thank you for watching the Broadway.com show. We leave you with Annalie Ashford singing Wonderful from Wicked. It's positively bewitching. See you next week.